podcast, the show with undiplomatic takes about the foreign policy scene. I'm your host, Van Jackson. And today's show is unprecedented. Maybe it's not the last time, but I think you're going to love this. We have two interview guests. Uh, they're both literally two of the smartest people I know on political economy. I'm not buttering them up. And they deserve their own episodes, frankly, but it was my dream to get them both in the room with each other. And I've actually pulled that off. So we've we've talked about on the show many times the root causes of and the solutions to far right politics and global insecurity, how they're disproportionately in the realm of political economy. And this is kind of why these two guests are here today. Ultimately, um, they really do know what the fuck they're talking about their work, their analysis. It tells stories that make sense of our current dystopian conditions. And then their perspective, which I obviously share, it's policy relevant, it's actionable, right? So guess number one, he's maybe the most readable economic historian I've ever come across. Uh, he's unbelievably good explainer of esoteric shit. Uh, and you can find his essays in everywhere that matters, right? Dissent, The Nation, Jacobin, Phenomenal World, uh, The New Republic, The New Inquiry. He's a Harvard PhD, um, and his dissertation, which was defended, I think, earlier this year, was publicly praised by a number of like big celebrity scholars, including Adam Tooze. And I've gotten a, a sneak peek of it. It's going to make a very good book. Um, I'm sure it will take forever to come out. But that that's it looks really good. Um, guest number two is a political scientist at George Washington University. He's published all over the place. And the thing that's remarkable about this guy is that he's using the quartermaster's tools in a sense, like rigorous social science methods to make analytical arguments about core issues in left progressive politics. So trade liberalization and labor rights, we'll hit that stuff today, but also like the bread and butter of economic democracy questions, you know, like wage and wealth inequality. So even though he's an assistant professor, this fucker's already got two books with Cambridge University Press. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the second one is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, literally just hit the streets. It's called opening up by cracking down labor repression and trade liberalization in um, democratic developing countries. So guest number one, none other than Tim the Carnival Barker. And guest number two, lean mean industrial machine, Adam Dean. Well, welcome to the show, guys. Thanks for having us. Yeah, great to be here. Yes, likewise. So I have a bunch of questions that I want to throw at you guys, but to frame things up, you know, most people who work in the national security space, uh, they tend to either bracket off questions of political economy or they inherit this like economist magazine worldview, which is basically neoliberal. But like at a minimum, it's usually putting foreign policy to work for like on behalf of plutocrats. And one of the things that worries me a lot right now is like how Washington seems to be moving away from neoliberalism, not the fact of moving away, but like how. Um, and so, you know, Build Back Better or like the project of national rejuvenation in the US, whatever we want to call it, whatever else it is, it is also a project of expanding the national security state through a new Cold War, through military Keynesianism. Um, and I'm putting that out there and then I'm putting a pin in it immediately. So like, I want to circle back to that, but I, I'm mentioning it now just because it's kind of the context for this, for this episode. And, and you guys know this, but the economic order that started taking shape in the 1970s was one where the state aligned itself with capital, increasingly against workers. And this happened with, with monetary policy, which we'll talk about later. It happened with, you know, austerity policies. It also happened through trade liberalization, it turns out, free trade, right? Which became a kind of weapon against workers. Uh, it was a key pillar of neoliberal globalization, of course. And so Adam, with that preface, I, I wanted to start with your book, Opening Up by Cracking Down. It's a very rigorous, smart book, and it directly <laughs> takes on this question of relations between like labor and international trade. And so I was hoping you could explain you described it as like a revisionist book, 
what makes it revisionist? What are the takeaways for like most of the audience who won't have read it yet because it's brand new, right? Um, and what is labor repression? Sure. Um, so the basic punchline um, is that the, the book tells the story of how democratic developing countries often use the labor repression to overcome labor union opposition to free trade. So it's part of, it's a, a book about the process of opening up and the way in which uh, governments pulled that off. Uh, the reason why I say that it's a revisionist account, both, both theoretically and empirically, uh, is because it sort of goes up against two different sort of conventional wisdoms uh, in, in my field. Uh, one is that uh, trade liberalization was all about democratization, that democratization uh, enfranchised workers in developing countries and yeah. that free trade or trade liberalization was going to benefit all of those workers in developing countries. So they took their newfound votes and they voted for trade liberalization. So in that story, democratization caused free trade through the demands of, of workers. Um, one of the problems with that approach is that there's all these countries that democratized but then maintained closure because of opposition from unions. And so it sort of misses one that there was opposition from unions, right? That sort of neoliberal conventional wisdom is that all workers in developing countries benefit from trade and so they all supported it. So they're just sort of ignoring the fact that labor unions all over the developing world uh, opposed those reforms. Uh, and then second, they, they won a lot of times. There are all these cases where new democracies uh, back down in the face of labor union opposition and maintained closure or opened up very slowly. Uh, so again, this sort of very different account uh, and then the second narrative uh, that, I, that I'd like to push back against is this idea that democratic countries, when they face opposition, compensate those people who are in opposition. So there's a, mm. a sort of like compensation hypothesis that's popular in political economy, which argues that uh, it's only autocracies or non-democracies that are able to really uh, repress uh, people who lose from trade. So the idea is that uh, democracies, when they face opposition, because they acknowledge that globalization is going to hurt uh, certain groups, that the way that democracies overcome that opposition is by buying them off through a welfare state safety net, um, because they simply, by definition, have no other real option, because it's only authoritarian regimes that can use repression. And so the sort of theoretical and empirical revision is just to say that that's just not at all how the world has worked, that uh, mm -hmm. many democratic countries repeatedly uh, use labor repression uh, rather than welfare compensation or as part of a broader strategy for overcoming that union opposition. And when I say labor repression, what I have in mind is the, the basic violation of workers' rights to act collectively. So the right to strike, the right to unionize. Uh, in many of the cases I look at, uh, unions actively launched protests and general strikes against these reforms and government stepped in to break those general strikes or to limit the spread of those general strikes by arresting union leaders, by firing workers, by declaring those strikes illegal, by decertifying, by, by decertifying the unions that joined those strikes, uh, by manipulating union finances the governments had influence over, uh, threatening uh, union leaders. Uh, the book itself opens up with the, a car bomb that blew up the president, uh, or the secretary general of, of the Argentine. I was hoping you'd mention this. Yeah. Um, uh, so all sorts of repression that's just been left out uh, of the of the story that we that we tell ourselves that we tell our students. Um, so the book is is trying to change the way we think about globalization theoretically and and sort of setting the record straight empirically. Yeah, that's great. Um, you describe two pathways to labor repression. One is the I mean, if I botch this, fucking correct me. But the one is the authoritarian regimes that that we're already repressing labor because they're authoritarian regimes. And then they liberalize trade as they democratize. And then the second pathway was like democratic regimes where labor repression was literally part of trade liberalization, like repress labor so that you can liberalize meaningfully. Um, yeah. And so in the latter case, that's like very disturbing and sort of counter our imagination, you know, like, why did democratization lead to trade empowerment rather than labor empowerment? Um, and I'm wondering, too, if you could, like, discuss the India case a bit, because it was pretty crucial. But also, this, there's, like, an Asia-heavy audience in this in this show. Sure. Yeah, so you, you got the pathways right, two different pathways to trade liberalization. Um, you know, the basic logic is uh, that 
you know, uh, countries used uh, democracy and labor repression. So it's a sort of combination of the two of them. Uh, democratization, I think, was an important part of the, the story. It empowered new voices in the policymaking process, many of which favored trade liberalization. So that could be a number of actors. It could be export-oriented businesses that were kind of excluded from uh, political influence under authoritarianism. So democratization gives their demands for trade liberalization uh, new power. It could also be consumers that were interested in lower prices. There's a lot of work on, on this idea that trade liberalization was, was fairly popular, especially in the 80s uh, in, the, in the midst of the debt crisis and hyperinflation and people really looking for any kind of alternative. There's ideological reasons why the, the general public might have supported trade liberalization. This is like the Thatcher period of there is no alter there's the, there's no alternative. Um, mm -hmm. So all sorts of reasons why democratization would have empowered groups that favored free trade. But unions, as we talked about, oppose those reforms. And unions are also a potential a group that can be potentially empowered by democratization. Uh, so it was really democratization had the potential to lead to opening because it empowered these pro trade groups. But then whether or not unions could counterbalance those new demands for free trade depended on the, like, the level of respect for labor rights. And it was only where there was labor oppression with democracy that you yeah. got new voices for free trade without countervailing uh, demands from, uh, from unions to, to stop those reforms. And so since you need democracy and labor oppression, the logic of it is simple. You could have them in two different orders, right? You could have... Um, uh, labor repression then democracy then like mm -hmm. you said that's like um countries that democratize and then just kept the repression from the authoritarian past into the future uh, so this is like what happens in turkey very starkly turkey democratizes in 1983 and the the new demo the new, the new democratic government in 83 just leaves all of these repressive laws on the books from the military regime from 1980 to 1983 the military junta that ruled turkey and so they just say, like, look, rather than uh, let the unions back into civil society, we're just going to leave the main radical labor federation banned. We're going to leave the labor union leaders that are facing uh, trial in prison, and we're going to leave the ban on strikes in place. Right. So this is a, a labor repression first. You add democracy, continue the labor repression, and they open up the economy very quickly uh, after mm -hmm. 1983. And then the other case is the reverse order. You, you have a, a new democracy that respects workers' rights. Uh, this come about for various historical reasons. I'm working on a new project looking at the role of uh, labor-led democratization. So when unions sort of dominate or lead the struggle for democracy, you tend to get a new democracy that respects workers' rights in a sort of straightforward way. Uh, mm -hmm. And then that lasts for a period of time. And in, in different countries, sometimes it's two to three or five years. In India, it's many decades, right? So unions lead the struggle for democracy in India or independence in India in the 40s. Um, and then for many, many decades, India is, India is thought of as a bastion of strong labor unions and pro-labor uh, protections. And it's not till the 1990s uh, that this uh, stable democracy increases labor repression to overcome union opposition to reform. Um, and so I'm happy to tell you a little bit more about the the India case now, if, if you'd like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so the, the way to think about India, I think, because there's been so much, um, at least in political science, so much, and economics, obviously, so much praise for the reforms of India in the 1990s, right? This is the period of opening the economy. Narasim Harrell, the prime minister, um, in the early 90s, implements this new economic policy of privatization and trade liberalization and various kinds of kinds of reform. Um, and a lot of it just focuses on like the, the positive impact that people think that had on Indian economic growth. And, and because of the focus on, on that positive reform, uh, there's, there's very few people that go back and look at the 1980s when a very similar package of reforms was proposed by an earlier prime minister, Re Rajiv Gandhi. Um, mm -hmm. And in that period in the mid, mid 80s, that, um, that series of reforms that, that Gandhi uh, proposes trigger a series of general strikes. And those general strikes contribute to Gandhi backing down. So he had, he had started to lower tariffs in India and after these general strikes, decides very quickly to put them back up. Um, so he backs down in the face of labor union opposition. Then once you get to the early 90s, 
Narasim Harao and the Congress Party is very aware of what happened in the 80s. It wasn't that it was just like five, six years in the past. Uh, so they know that a democracy that respects workers' rights, that wants to reform, is going to face union opposition. Mm -hmm. And they know that those general strikes are going to be a major obstacle to reforms. Uh, and so Rajiv um, Narasim Harao goes to the unions after they declared the first general strike in 1991. And he, and he sends somebody to, to meet with them from the, from the government uh, just a few days before the general strike. And they say, like, you know, we want to offer you a form of compensation. We're going to offer you, like, these um, consultation meetings that we'll have between the government and the unions. And you'll be able to show mm -hmm. that you're being taken seriously. And we'll make sure that nothing, nothing bad happens to the workers that you represent. And they say, like, you know, what are you talking about? The strike's like in three days. This is like you can't you can't cancel the strike three days from now. So they go ahead with the strike, and 10 million people turn out across the country for the, for the strike. Six months later, uh, they call another general strike. And in India, general strikes are not like endless strikes. They're one day symbolic uh, general strikes. So uh, okay, I was wondering about that. Strike. Yeah. So six months later, they call another one in June of 1992. Uh, Narasimha Harao has learned that negotiating with the unions, offering them, you know, some kind of olive branch uh, isn't going to stop uh, these general strikes, par partially because uh, that kind of compensation doesn't make workers whole, right? Workers are, are, have good union jobs in these protected industries. They know that hundreds of thousands of layoffs are coming if they open up those industries. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it's, it's very hard to get unions to give up the fight um, when you're offering what, what unions in the United States call barrel insurance. Right, that this is really just buying people off and giving them a pittance that's never going to make them whole. So it's very hard to buy them off. And so uh, in June of 92, uh, rather than approach the unions and ask them to stop, uh, Narasim Harao and the chief ministers of many states around uh, India start to use what's called preventive arrest. And this is a part of the common law tradition uh, inherited from Britain and then formalized in the Indian constitution. And this, a little bit like the Tom Cruise movie, um, <laughs> uh, Minority Report, is that what it's called? Where uh, yeah, yeah. You go around arresting people who they know are going to break the law. In India, the government has, has the power to arrest people preventively to stop them from breaking the law. So, so believe it or not, in, in, the, in the week before that June 1992 general strike, uh, the Indian government ar arrests and detains 25,000 Indian union members around the country many of them in the south of India, uh, with, the, with the very clear goal of limiting the spread of that general strike. Um, it took me a while to sort of understand this because, uh, you know, strike, you want, you want people to, you want to break the strike, you want people to go to work. So how is keeping them in jail going to can help? And so what's going on here really is that it's trying to stop picketing during the general strike. The, the unions in India and many other places picket the bus stations and the train stations, trying to mm -hmm. shut down the transportation network with the idea yeah. being that if they shut down the transportation network, then nobody can go to work and they can claim that nobody went to work because they joined the general strike, even if it's you know a political strategy that's a little disingenuous. But both the government and the unions during this period agree that the size of the general strike, how many people are joining the strike, is a real measure or a barometer for public opinion. And as they go from general strike to general strike in the 90s, there's this debate about are the general strikes getting bigger or smaller? And so this strategy of, of preventively arresting tens of thousands of union members to make sure the trains and buses keep running on the margins make a really big difference when you then point out that like, look, this strike is a little bit smaller than the previous strike and the government can claim over the course of a few general strikes that they're, that they're repressing uh, through this behavior. They can claim public opinion is shifting towards the government. We have a growing consensus in favor of reform because of the shrinking nature of these general strikes with no honesty, you know, or sincerity about what's really going on, what's really driving, uh, or at least contributing uh, mightily to the reduction in the size of these general strikes. Jesus, dude. Preventive arrest, that's a bitch. Um, so the, the India case brings to mind a great essay in the Boston Review, like maybe a year ago. Where I can't remember who wrote it. I'll try to put it in the show notes. But the guy argued that like neoliberals end up needing neo-fascists in a way and allying with them at a certain point because eventually it's like the only logical way to preserve absurd concentrations of wealth. 
right? Uh, and he was using the India example of alliances between like ethno-nationalists and neoliberals to make that case, like the Indian political context. And like the logic of opening up by cracking down, it's not the same argument, but it's it's compatible. Like it's you're in a similar vibe or something like there, there's something there that like or if if they're willing to open up by cracking down why wouldn't they be willing to align with fascists you know it's very interesting yeah i mean in, in my book i don't go that far um i mean labor repression is is normatively reprehensible yeah, i don't want to attribute to in, yeah. my, in, my, in my opinion <laughs> um uh, I, I can see why you'd bring up the the similarity I, was, I will say one of the things that puzzles people about the book sometimes is like that implicitly there's this concept of like uh, of an anti-labor democracy and you know a lot of people say that uh you know definitionally that's not a democracy a democracy that's willing to preventively arrest tens of thousands of people forfeits its claims to being a legitimate democracy um you know from a normative point of view you know i share that commitment i think that democracies ought to respect labor rights uh, I think part of the power, hopefully, of my book is pointing out that there's all these countries that are widely considered democracies, um, you know, and just by case experts, uh, but also by all of like the quantitative indices and measures that we have in the social sciences of measuring how democratic countries are. You know, all of these countries during the periods I'm studying them are, are widely acknowledged or considered to be democracies and yet are behaving in this way, yet are repressing unions, violating basic workers' rights. So, so yes, I share that commitment that this is hypocritical and problematic, uh, but from a descriptive analytical point of view, these are democracies that are violating labor rights, not non-democracies. Yes, that that is at the heart of why it's so troubling, I think. Or like, it's that's what confounds expectations. Yeah. Um, Tim, Adam's book converges nicely with an essay you had in Descent Magazine last year also called The End of Development. And you talk about secular stagnation hitting the global south, uh, which I read you as saying is like a new kind of problem. Um, and you say that, quote, our political fates remain linked by the movement of global demand, end quote. So first, can you unpack you know, what is secular stagnation? My audience is not primarily econ people. Yeah. Uh, second, how does the trend of falling global demand, you know, for things like manufactured goods, how does that hit, uh, you know, developing economies in particular? Uh, sure. Um, so, you know, to start with the, the adjective there, secular um, doesn't in this case mean the opposite of religious, it's the opposite of cyclical, right? So, I mean, just, right. you know, it, it's very confused. I was confused when I first encountered that terminology. Um, uh, so it's not the stagnation of uh, non-religious groups. Uh, it's a long-term economic stagnation, right? That's not a kind of typical cyclical downturn where you'd expect the economy to be depressed one year and buoyant the next year. Mm -hmm. um, it's an idea that actually the, in those terms emerges in the 1930s, you know, for pretty understandable reasons when there's a global Great Depression. And it's used um, by this guy named Alvin Hansen, who's one of the leading uh, American exponents of Keynesian economics. And he gives a speech in 1938, sort of raising this possibility uh, for the United States. And then the, the concept kind of fades into obscurity for decades because, you know, uh, from a lot of people's perspective, Hansen got that bet world historically wrong. Because as we know, after World War II, you know, there's a kind of wave around the world of historically unprecedented growth. Uh, I happen to think that that uh, rejection of Hansen is a little unfair because Hansen never said that we were doomed to secular stagnation. He just said that private investment wouldn't be enough to end secular stagnation. And if you think about all the public investment that happened mostly, but not exclusively in the form of military spending between 1938 and 1960, uh, it's easy to see Hansen actually being vindicated. Um, the term, as I said, was sort of languors uh, in obscurity until Larry Summers, of all people, starts to revive it around 2010, 2011 uh, to talk about the really sort of extended, slow recovery from the 2008 downturn. And the secular part comes in there because, you know, the recession hits bottom, the expansion technically begins, but you still have unemployment remaining very, very high, even in the U.S. and certainly around the world. Um, and so since then, it's kind of gotten more and more of a hearing uh, and what was intriguing to me, you know, as someone coming from a left wing perspective is how the term and the idea got taken up by mainstream people like Summers, right? People who mm -hmm. had been cheerleaders of capitalism, people who, when I was growing up in the 90s and early 2000s, thought that capitalism was going to turn, you know, every country in the world into some model of the United States, you know, with 
you know, people in Bangladesh would go from working in sweatshops to working in, you know, tech companies and eventually end up little different from, you know, people in the United States. The same people who had thought that were suddenly singing a really different tune. And that pessimism, you know, among the people who were rooting for global capitalism struck me as really interesting. Um, so the piece, you know, that you referred to, which came out in Dissent, sort of started from that question. And, you know, there's something a little bit hubristic or absurd about writing a 4,000 word essay about the entire world economy. Obviously, the world economy is made up of That's what we hundreds, do, man. <laughs> hundreds of economies, right? You know, each with their own story, you know, that you could spend a whole lifetime studying. And on top of that, I'm trained as a U.S. historian. You know, there's an actual discipline called international political economy, which, you know, Adam is, is much closer to. Uh, and I, you know, don't formally belong to that. But I, I did notice that U.S. historians can be just incredibly parochial, right? Like incredibly uninterested in the rest of the world. And so I thought it's worth trying to study the rest of the world, even if you're coming to it as, as you know, somewhat of an amateur. And so the perspective I took was to say, you know, here's this problem of global stagnation. And then a second kind of catchphrase that had started to make the rounds in mainstream economics, which is this idea of premature deindustrialization, uh, which mm -hmm. was actually coined in a Latin American context, but then became really popular um, through the work of a guy named Danny Roderick at the Harvard Kennedy School. Yeah. Um, so a, a Turkish economist working in the United States. And so what's premature deindustrialization? The idea is that uh, countries in the global south were deindustrializing at an earlier point in their developmental trajectory than had happened in places like the United States. So in the US, you know, we can think about industrialization stretching all the way from the 19th century into the 1970s, you know, and in absolute terms, the number of manufacturing workers in the US peaks around 1979, you know, it, as a share of employment, it peaks earlier. But that's a sort of long trajectory, leaving behind a lot of development in its wake. But if you look at a country like Brazil or Mexico or um, most of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa, they seem to start deindustrializing at an earlier point, you know, looking at how many people are working in industry and before as much sort of, um, you know, collateral benefit has come from the industrialization. And so that's a version of the secular stagnation problem because there's a general consensus uh, among economists that manufacturing has some specific benefits in terms of its uh, its amenability to productivity increases. You know, so you can imagine that, uh, you know, there's a sort of easy answer to the question of what comes after deindustrialization starts. It's a service economy. But again, even mainstream economists seem to really agree that services aren't as amenable to kind of systematic productivity increases the way you see uh, in manufacturing. And so there's less opportunity for economy wide growth in a service economy. And so I was sort of, you know, starting from these increasingly mainstream no notions of secular stagnation, premature deindustrialization, I asked mm -hmm. the question sort of what, like, what path forward does this leave for the global South? And I tried to survey, again, like looking at these people who are rooting for global capitalism. And I came to the conclusion that they didn't really have much of an answer. You know, they kind of would do hand waving if you put to them this question of what comes after, you know, the industrial uh, export led model of growth. You know, people would talk about tourism. They would say, you know, well, Rwanda it really has a promising future because people go there to like do gorilla hunts or not, not hunts to kill, but, you know, to go look at gorillas in a Jeep or something, or they'd say everyone can get on Etsy. And that's like a, you know, wonderful new path to development or just these increasingly lud ludicrous ideas, right. For what would take the place. And so yeah. obviously I, I couldn't definitively say that, you know, is, this is the end of development, but what I did feel kind of comfortable saying was that no one had a very clear idea of what was supposed to take the place of this, you know, export led industry centered growth that had led some countries to become richer during the 20th century. Yeah. And that's why I like loved the piece, but also I was like, fuck, what is the, what is the next thing? Um, Adam, I wanted to bring Tim's research or like observation into dialogue with your research. Um, and on some level, this is just like a sanity check. So maybe I'm, I'm off base or whatever, but if the rulers of developing economies are imposing repressive labor conditions in order to climb the global economy, economy ladder, like, in, you know, um, doesn't that require that the high or presuppose like higher levels of global demand or sufficiently high levels of global demand for exports, which Tim is saying is basically like disappearing. Can um, I add like, just one point before we get into that? Yeah. yeah. So just, it's, it was funny. I remember, you know, I wrote the thing before COVID and remember doing a launch event for it in like April, 2020. So to some extent, what I said there was a, a pre COVID take. Um, and we can talk about what has changed and what hasn't since then, but just, just to put that in there. Oh, well, I'm, what, what? Okay, well, let's, let's go to Adam first, and yeah. then I want to just jump in as as needed. Like, am I am I off base? Am I tra But am I missing something here? Like, if global demand is decreasing, um, but 
global demand is what's necessary for like export oriented economies who are repressing labor so that they can be export. Or what, what this sounds fucked to me, right? Yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not here to disagree uh, with that. Like the model of export led growth assumed uh, sort of an increasing demand for those uh, goods that would be produced. Uh, and there's, you know, very mixed evidence about which countries uh, were successful uh, with export-led growth. Certainly not most of Latin America. It's obviously, obviously successes. And what are some, um, like some of the East Asian countries that industrialized in the 70s and 80s, sometimes, sometimes a little bit earlier. Uh, but there's, you know, lots of debates for decades now about how those countries actually got there, right? Did they do it by simply opening up their economy the way that the IMF and World Bank were suggesting in the U.S.? pressured countries to do during the period, or did they do so through, you know, protecting infant industries, a lot of what today is being called industrial policies, um, you know, so that there's relatively uh, little evidence that, that I see that, that simply opening up and shifting towards export-led growth on its own uh, has led to the kind of uh, promise that, that Tim pointed out uh, people have been making. Do you have anything to add, Tim? Or? Well, just to, you know, to expand on why I was, I was trying to cover my ass a little there, which is that you know the, the the secular stagnation picture is one in which supply is sort of in excess of demand. And what mm -hmm. happened during COVID and has continued to happen with the war in Ukraine is that in certain sectors, right, there's been supply shortages. It's you know, and picture, so yeah. in terms of like the demand for raw materials, which had kind of um, there had been a big sort of cycle in raw material demand, which crashed around 2015, 2016, we're seeing a new cycle of, of, of strong demand for certain raw materials, right? And also for certain, you know, high-end finished goods like semiconductors. So any, you know, any picture about secular stagnation needs to have some nuance about this new, you know, certain sectors where actually supply can't keep up with demand, right? Um, but I think I still hold to my general pessimism because, you know, we've seen cycles of commodity price uh, increases before, which can lead to a lot of money flowing into, you know, countries that produce commodities, but they often don't leave behind a lot of developmental residue, right? We saw that in the 70s was a great example of this, right? Where, um, you know, countries like uh, Mexico, which I think is one of the ones that Adam writes about in his book, you know, see a lot of money coming in because of oil, like in the late 70s. And then by 1982, the price of oil, cry, you know, crashes and it ends up giving Mexico a decade without growth at all. So I, I don't think it changes that much, um, especially because like on the semiconductor side, it's not like a poor country can just become a semiconductor maker, right? That's sort of a, right. a rival. That's a rivalry now between rich countries to see who's going to make the semiconductors. So it still doesn't offer this like ladder to development. But I just, I think that it's easy to sort of turn secular stagnation into this blanket prophecy of doom when actually we're seeing now, you know, there'll be some places where investment is, is rewarded because demand is higher than, than supply at the moment. Yeah, and there you know, supply bottlenecks too. Like, so you have more than one problem, which it's almost a poly crisis, if you you might call it. <laughs> well, one thing, sort of uh, picking up on on that um, that I haven't written about, but I've been thinking about um, a little bit, is whether or not we, we've seen. I haven't seen anything written about it, but maybe I'm just not looking in the right places. Um, whether, whether or not we've seen or will see like increased bargaining power for workers in these sort of critical nodes in the supply chain, right? So there's this great book by Beverly Silver called Forces yeah. of Labor. Uh, where she so I'm reading out. that now. It's so fucking yeah. good. Yeah, it's, it's excellent. It's excellent. Can you, sorry, keep um, going. But this idea that like workers that find themselves in a critical node of production, a sort of choke point, if you will, have enormous uh, leverage over their employers if, if they're able to seize it. And so this is like yeah. the story, perhaps most famously, the sit-down strikes of the CIO in the 1930s, right? Like bringing the auto industry to its knees uh, by selectively having sit-down strikes in like factories that were making key parts for, for cars and bringing the whole industry uh, to a standstill. And so there's been all this talk for years now about uh, like the, the shortage of semiconductors and different chips and all these things. And I've been wondering, like, are there unions forming uh, and workers sort of seizing those opportunities in Taiwan yeah. and other places uh, where there's like, you know, especially with COVID, not just like shipping slowing down, but like the number of factories closing for COVID protocols, you know, all over Asia. So just wondering if there's stories. I don't know if Dan or Tim, if you've, if you've heard any sort of optimistic stories about um, union growth and, and workers sort of seizing those opportunities to improve working conditions, to increase wages, and to get unions recognized in places where I imagine it's been very hard in the past. That's a great point. 
Are you aware I mean, of anything, Tim? It's obviously an incomplete struggle, but I think it's it's easy to see um, labor struggles at Amazon in the last couple of years in that light, right? They're not they're not um, mining for raw material or building something semiconductors, high, yeah. like semiconductors. But you know, for for things to get shipped, right, it is a choke point, and they obviously have a long way to go. Um, but I, I do think they, you know, individual warehouses have started to unionize, and Amazon workers have seen their wages go up, and I think that's, you know. A, almost certainly related to their their place in the circulation of these things, right? Which is which is slightly different than what I was talking about, but related. I'd love to know more about um, the labor stuff in, in Taiwanese semiconductor factories, but I've, I've never read about it. Yeah, that's the... There's sorry. a little bit of a... There's a double-edged sword too, which is, you know, um, on the one hand, I guess we'll get into this later when we talk about military Keynesianism, but on the one hand, like, you know, wartime or quasi wartime situations create a lot of strength, uh, potential strength for workers, right? Because all of a sudden, you know, you're not just producing cars to make a profit, you're producing warplanes that are needed to defend a country. Um, on the other hand, wartime can be an example of exactly this kind of democratic labor repression that Adam, you know, talks about, yeah. certainly in other countries, but in the United no States, time for um, rights. Yeah. no one remembers this, but the... Um, the first time the federal government used federal troops to break a strike since the 1890s was in 1940, before That's the U.S. Enough. actually entered. Yep, before the U.S. had even entered World War uh, II to break a strike uh, at um, an aircraft plant in the West Coast. Man, okay, That's, uh, we're, we're not done with that conversation. Um, for both of you guys, in past episodes of the show, um, we've talked about the Asian tiger miracle economies whatever you want to call it um several times i have a book coming out in january that that deals with them or situates them um and so that's why i talk about it a lot but also because you know the way that they developed with relying on exports for economic growth authoritarian capitalism right trying to climb up a value chain a fucking flying geese all that shit that is like the story um to understand Asian security dynamics now, like that's what sets the scene. It's the context for great power rivalry, you know, um, but no other region pulled off what East Asia pulled off. Right. It was a product of a unique historical moment. It was not all upside. There was a dark side to it, you know, and it's not clear to me even where East Asia, like where East Asia goes from here, let alone can others copy it. And, you know, Tim's article suggests that like, no, they can't copy it because we don't know what will work anymore. But it's, you know, I'm presupposing the question. <laughs> uh, how much of a model is the East Asian development model for East Asia or for others, for both of you guys? Like, how do you think about it? Uh, I have thoughts, but Adam, if you want to go ahead, you can. I mean, so I was just gonna say, you know, I'm, I'm again, not really a specialist in East Asian history, but where I really got into it um, in my dissertation research was looking at sort of the kickoff of this uh, around the year 1950, when there's, I argue, a, you know, a, a global boom driven by the Korean War rearmament. And yeah. I think looking at that moment, which is, um, especially for Japan, is just ground zero, right? Um, there's a whole series of great quotes from, you know, heads of Japanese companies, heads of you know, the Japanese banks, that this is like a manna from heaven or like a gift from the gods. You know, there's celebration in Japan uh, when this war breaks out because the Japanese economy was actually in a really precarious position at that time. Um, after World War II, uh, Japan undergoes a process that's really in a lot of ways related to what um, Adam talks about in his book, right? The Japanese fascism had been incredibly labor repressive right, uh, in addition to the normal labor oppression that goes along with wartime in any society. Uh, but after the end of the war, there's actually a huge upsurge of, you know, democratic rank and file labor struggles and all kinds of social struggles. And the U.S. occupation is initially quite sympathetic to this, right, because, you know, they're New Dealers. They, you know, they don't wish to revive the power of the big Japanese corporations, which they see as a kind of social base for Japanese fascism. Uh, but then the U.S. does what's called a reverse course and actually starts uh, supporting the companies against the workers, right, and, you know, purging the left from the trade unions. There's, you know, there's like a, a would-be general strike, which is, you know, put off by MacArthur. And so it's, in a lot of ways, lines up a lot with what Adam um, um, talks about. But the problem with that is that in order to repress labor, they end up putting the Japanese economy through the ringer. And so at the time the Korean War starts, uh, th the balance of class forces in Japan has shifted to favor capital, but the economy as such is kind of in a pretty disastrous deflation. And so the Korean War provides a way to um, 
stimulate the economy without strengthening you know, uh, domestic social forces like such as labor or anti-monopolist forces. And so it's a way to sort of keep Japanese social relations in place while pumping up the economy. And it, you know, it's just, this is all a long winded saying of, it does come down to a lot of really specific circumstances. And this is just one of them where if you take it away, Toyota would have gone out of business, right? They're like days away from bankruptcy almost when this war starts. And then, you know, you see that not just the war, but the sort of the careful planning of, you know, the Japanese government to sort of use the proceeds from the war boom to reinvest and move up the value chain, as you say, um, that leaves them by the end of, you know, the 50s to really be on the path to, you know, exporting consumer electronics to the US. It's very hard for me to see any of that happening without, you know, a civil war in Korea, which very easily could not have happened if a few things had been different. Yeah. Adam, do you have anything to add or amend? All right. Um, so both of you guys have research. I'm going to sort of go back to like the neoliberalism thing and military Keynesianism I put a pin in. You've both got research focusing on the latter half of the 20th century um, and that means you're directly grappling with the thing we call neoliberalism, right? So, you know, my working definition that I tell people is like, well, neoliberalism is the primacy of capital over labor. It's just that simple, right? But, you know, people describe it in different ways, you know, basket of policies, ideology, order, whatever. Um, so, like, how should people listening to this understand what neoliberalism is first, you know? And do you think it's still an important object to critique on the left? So I'll start off by saying that um, obviously there's various ways to think about neoliberalism. In, in my work and specifically in my, in my new book, I think of it, you know, along the lines of your definition as a, of a bundle of economic policies. Um, so, I, you know, I'm focusing specifically on trade policy, but it's also during a period in world history where governments are enacting, proposing and then enacting uh, like broad packages of these neoliberal reforms. So I mentioned before trade liberalization, privatization, sometimes labor law reform, um, you know, ver various ways of liberalizing the economy. Um, and and I, you often see unions opposing uh, not just trade liberalization, but also obviously privatization, right? So if you're a public sector worker and privatization is gonna mean mass layoffs, you get these broader coalitions of unions opposing an entire package of reforms. And so for me, like the politics of neoliberalism are sort of inseparable in, in that way, right? So these struggles in developing countries, uh, I focus on the trade aspect, but the reality is that they're situated in this broader context of you know what you could call neoliberal reform that triggers widespread opposition, not just from unions that are worried about trade, but unions that are worried about all these other economic policies that are being implemented at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Van, I mean, I like your definition because it doesn't focus on markets, you know, or ideology. I think there's a common way of thinking about neoliberalism, which is mostly to pay attention to what people like Milton Friedman said, right? And sort of publicize yeah. neoliberalism. Um, and sometimes even enemies of neoliberalism just sort of reproduce what they said, but put a bad valence on it. You know, so Milton Friedman said markets will solve all problems. Then the critics of neoliberalism will say Milton Friedman thought that markets will solve all problems, but they don't. Um, but the problem with that is that, you know, neoliberalism involves a uh, a state, right? Not just incidentally, but centrally. You know, if you just look at the size of the government, you know, in any country since neoliberalism, or if you look at the specific things the government is doing, right? Whether it's mm -hmm. uh, repressing labor or you know bailing out a bank, you know, like many of the central constitutive things that neoliberalism is involve a strong state. And so I think it's better to think of it in the way you suggested, Van, as a kind of a certain kind of balance of class forces, right? And I think that that also offers us the advantage of being able to say. Well, yeah, we should keep complaining about it because that thing hasn't changed yet, right? Even if we get a little bit of industrial policy, we can still look at the share of national income going to labor and see it's much lower than it was before 1980. Uh, we can look at the you know, number of uh, workers, private sector workers in unions and say that that's mm -hmm. still lower. And so like once those things begin to change, you know, we can start to talk about an end of neoliberalism. Until then, I think it's, it's a little bit premature, although like we should be attentive to the things are changing, right? There's, you know, it hasn't all been one thing since the 70s. And so I, I, in my work and my writing, I try to strike a balance between focusing on that big top line continuity and also being attentive to things which, you know, I think it's hard to look at the Biden administration and see it as completely unchanged from the Obama administration, even though I would call both neoliberal. Yeah, I mean, so this is something I was going to ask 
um, in a more elaborate way, but like you just started to to hit at it right now. The so like in DC, neoliberalism as like a term, people are starting to recognize like, oh, that's not kosher, or, or like there's some there's some kind of stigma building around it. But it's like the direction that they're taking it is into something that they call industrial policy, but which would be fine depending on what you mean. But like it's really something awful and Pentagon shaped um, the, what they're doing. And the, it, the, you, you said like we're not out of neoliberalism yet. And so therefore it's still a valid thing to critique. And like I, certainly, I definitely don't disagree with that. But like what – what are we as U.S. political economy and as like a global economic order? Like, is it's not a ne is it a neoliberal hegemony? I mean, like, just in terms of character, you got to know your enemy, right? Like, so what what are we characterizing here at the U.S. level and the global level for for like either of you? I mean, it's complicated to apply a label to the whole world, you know, and we could probably have a whole. <laughs> We could have a whole podcast on what it means for neoliberal global order that, you know, the Chinese Communist Party controls one of the biggest capitalist economies in the world, yes. right? So there's a lot of of complicated uh, stuff there. So it might be that yes. it, it might be that you need a, a different, uh, you know, a different label for the the international order than you do for the the domestic politics of a country. Um, I mean, I think, but you know, one way of thinking about the current global order is it's still a dollar-centered order, right? And that's uh, yeah. I mean, order is sticky, though. So, like, there's going to be residue, and dollar centrality is surely like the most potent residue. But there's like, and there's others, you know. Um, I don't know. There, if you guys have thoughts about that, let me know. Um, I mean, another another continuity is to look at sort of you know what's happening to. Uh, third world or global south countries facing debt crises now, right? Mm -hmm. um, and both in in terms of you know the fact that they have they they're not getting a lot of help despite you know being put through the ringer by something that's a bit you know essentially started in the United States you know with you know the U.S. the U.S. Federal Reserve acting as its kind of de facto central banker for the world, but not you know offering sort of fiscal support to the rest of the world. That's a a long, long term continuity, right? Which reminds us again of the 80s when there was also really tight monetary policy in the US with really horrendous effects in the rest of the world. And if you look at what the IMF you know, wants in terms of conditionality from places like Pakistan or Sri Lanka, that's not so different from what the IMF would have it's wanted. It's not really changed. There's, the the there's a narrative that even Stiglitz kind of was pushing in the past year that like, oh, the IMF has changed. And like, that doesn't really seem to be the case. Like IMF researchers put out research that suggests they understand that like austeritizing a loan recipient and forcing that kind of like economic circumscription that that has consequences. But then like, they're still imposing those kinds of demands on loan recipients. So, like, I feel like I'm taking fucking crazy pills. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. So Tim, you have this amazing chapter in a new edited volume called the military in the market. And the editors are, Fuck, Mark Wilson. Mark Wilson and Jennifer Middlestadt. Jennifer Middlestadt, yeah. So like my audience here has heard me talk about military Keynesianism a few times, but this is really your wheelhouse. I mean, you're this is central to your research. Like, So uh, what are the meanings of military Keynesianism? Why is it important for making sense of like politics and foreign policy in the 70s? The 70s too is like a really important economic hinge point in history that like, for net for security types, we fucking completely gloss over it. You know, neoliberalism, Volcker shock, like none of that shits in our narrative. So like what, how does military Keynesianism fit in, but also what are the meanings of it? Yeah. Um, so again, just to sort of break it down at, at the most simple level, you know, Keynes here is John Maynard Keynes, the English economist. And his basic idea was that the level of employment uh, and output in the entire economy was determined by the level of aggregate demand, right? It sounds simple, but it was a big idea at the time and, you know, considered kind of heretical. And so military Keynesianism would be a situation where uh, output and employment were increased by a uh, boost to specifically military demand, right? Um, there, are, there are different kinds of ways you could stimulate aggregate demand, uh, and this is one particular way of doing it. 
uh, already in the general theory, um, which is Keynes's big book in 1936, he mentions the possibility of like war uh, or building pyramids, you know, as, as sort of bad ways that his economics could be put into practice, but it's kind of a joke. Uh, and then by 1940 or 41, he's writing things saying that actually, I see no way that my ideas could be put into practice except like on a wartime footing. So in a few years, it goes from a kind of offhand comment to like a real possibility. Um, it's important to say here that there's a kind of ambiguity in the term military Keynesianism because it can it can sort of refer either to a, a highly self-conscious intelligent project like to quote you know I, the chapter that you're talking about is mostly about Richard Nixon Nixon will use a phrase like goose the economy he'll say the best way to goose the economy uh, with government spending is military spending so that's a kind of really instrumental cynical military Keynesianism but people also use the word um, somewhat confusingly to refer to just the effects of a policy, right? So very few people, maybe no one would claim that World War II was started to help the economy, yet it is also the case that it helped put an end to the Great Depression. And so people also use the word there. And I think in writing my dissertation, I was kind of interested in seeing, okay, in the real world, at least as it's reflected in the historical record, what's the balance between this kind of instrumentalism and this kind of consequentialism? And it's always kind of a, mm. a mix, right? There's a, yeah. it's, not a, it's not a coincidence and it's not a conspiracy. I think, you know, generally wars start for other reasons that might have their own political economies, but they're not driven by, you know, the need for jobs at home. Uh, however, there's a lot of wiggle room in making military policy, especially in something like the Cold War, when you have a kind of wartime footing uh, that isn't always accompanied by a shooting war. And in that space, there's a lot of room for, you know, this instrumental side of military Keynesianism to come, come to the fore. Yeah. Did you, yep. Sorry. Tim, so, so uh, the way you're talking about military Keynesianism, uh, sort of like on an aggregate level, right? So you've got like yeah. federal spending on the military that's propping up the national economy. Yeah. Uh, what about like a uh, sort of like micro level military Keynesianism? I grew up near the Coast Guard Academy in, in uh, Connecticut. And uh, there's like the electric boat makes the nuclear submarines yeah. uh, close to there. And, you know, that whole part of the state is only, you know, economically viable, uh, I think, because of military spending and the sort of broader military industrial complex type stuff. So you can sort of see it, you know, sort of, uh, you know, across counties or across regions of the country where this military investment is going in versus places that aren't receiving those kinds of investments, too. A hundred percent. Military spending is not distributed um, evenly either across sectors or across geography. Right. And, uh, you know, I grew up in um, Brevard County, Florida, which is uh, home to Kennedy Space Center and also a lot of aerospace firms. And it's from know, Orlando. Oh, there you go. Um, <laughs> So, there, you know, there are pockets like this, you know, all over the country, but, you know, concentrated like uh, New England, like you mentioned, is, is one sort of pocket of this, you know, with Pratt and Whitney and uh, for General Electric in Massachusetts. And then more famously, kind of the Sun Belt in the South and West are, are other concentrations of this. And I um, in, in focusing on this military Keynesianism kind of macro framing, I in no way wanted to scant the importance of this micro or regional stuff. It just seemed to me that that story, the micro story, was somewhat more familiar, at least to U.S. historians. Um, so U.S. historians had written books about the Sun Belt because they saw that as connected to Barry Goldwater and Ronald Reagan. And I sort of wanted to make the point, sure, um, but this is also affecting people who live everywhere in the country. And so it was just kind of a question of bending the stick the other way. Um, but the macro economy is an abstraction made up of, of local economies. And so it's important to keep, you know, keep that in mind. And to, you know, to talk about the policy side, Van, you know, macro military Keynesianism, the, the the policy side of the coin for micro is industrial policy, right? Industrial yeah. policy doesn't doesn't aim at affecting the economy as a whole. It aims at uh, the growth of a specific sector that's strategically important. And so industrial policy conversations are essentially micro conversations, even if you hope, you know, that you pick the right sectors and then that'll have macro effects. Semiconductors is not really a macro question. Yeah, I started using the phrase national security Keynesianism in some sense, because I'm not always describe. I'm sometimes I'm describing a problem, but the problem is not just goosing the economy through military spending. It's like building this this national security economy, basically, which exists through these micro, yeah. you know, Sun Belt and Connecticut type economies where like people actually like exist and live and. Where it's it's a it's a way of distorting our, our economy, but in a very deliberate national security Spartan way. I don't know. 
Definitely. And like, I don't like, I also think there's a danger using the language of military Keynesism of implying that economics is always in command, but you can also see this right. as sort of serving fundamentally military militarist ends, you know? So if you're mm -hmm. someone making the argument that uh, there's some kind of a, a serendipity about using unemployed workers and unemployed plant and equipment to make military things, you could just as easily be approaching it from the military standpoint and say <coughs> how, great it is, how great it is that we have a depression because that means there's lots of workers on hand to build weapons. You know, you could come into it without really an economic motive at all in your mind, theoretically, and just see the same happy coincidence because it means that the economy can, um, it has the potential and the slack to, to sustain a military program, which otherwise would be economically difficult. So like, this isn't to say that in any sense, geopolitics is always driven by narrowly economic aims, right? Like clearly Hitler sees a happy, you know, convergence between the fact that Germans need jobs and he needs a, a warfare state you know, rather than wanting to increase the consumption and well-being of German citizens, which is not really, as we know, his top priority. Yeah, yeah. Um, to, put it, to put it mildly. To put it, <laughs> very delicate. Um, military Keynesianism was Nixon's, like, you, you, you talk about how this is like a go-to way for him to goose the economy. I had to look up what goose meant. And yeah. it turns out it's like you stick somebody, your fingers in someone's at, like in the anus or whatever. Like, oh, is that? I didn't know that. The, it's because it's to like jump start or catalyze, right. you know. That's but very that was, that, 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 perfectly perfectly Nixonian, right? So vivid, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's so much yeah. there to unpack too, like in a anyway, yeah. uh, Freudian sense. So like, okay, so military Keynesianism is a tactic that Nixon sees as useful for goosing the economy, um, but then he particularly starts... in the in the run up to his reelection in '72, right? So it's a yes. very part of what makes it such a beautiful example of the cynical version of military Keynesianism is he's just like. You know, he does badly in the midterm elections in 1970, and the memo goes out the next day. We got to start, you know, pumping up the economy with military spending. It's like very, very Melvin Laird and people are saying this shit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but so, like, that was what I was going to get to is like starting in 73, he's looking at an economy where inflation is becoming an issue and he needs to like reel it in. And so, uh, as part of that, you would think he would maybe reel in defense spending, but he kind of doesn't. Right. And so, Military spending goes up when you need to heat the economy, but then it stays up when you need to cool the economy. Is this, th that's the historical observation. Is that a problem? I'm, I'm almost asking that rhetorically, but. <laughs> a problem for, for who? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, there is this, like people talk about like a ratchet effect, right? It, it goes up and then, you know, even if it comes down, mm -hmm. it doesn't go back to the same level it was at before. And you see something really interesting. Um, what, which is really kind of mind bending when you start noticing it. Inflation is usually an excuse for cutting government spending, right? Mm -hmm. But in military spending, it is often offered up as a rationale for increasing military spending because they say, oh, inflation has lowered the real value of the defense budget. In order to preserve that, we actually need to raise the nominal, the dollar level of appropriations. And that's something you start to see developed in the 70s. And you still see it today. I was like, in, you know, if you read the defense industry news, they responded to this inflation in the last two years by saying it's actually a reason that defense spending needs to be higher. Because once you have this idea that the real value of that can't be cut, then inflation is actually a reason to raise this thing, which could actually be contributing to inflation. And so it's a kind of really ass backwards thing, but that becomes accepted. Um, and so people in the 70s arguing for a higher military budget would just routinely refer to the fact that inflation had taken value out of the military budget as a reason for pushing it higher, which is just, you know, it's to, to me, it's kind of mind bending. But if you if you're primed to take it for granted that we need a certain level of defense, uh, it has some political purchase. It's like a, a war price spiral instead of a wage price spiral. Absolutely. And if you think about, you know, the um, this was especially That's an article true waiting to be written the during the Cold spiral. War. But it's, it's true today, too, that, um, you know, one of the bottlenecks in an expanding economy is the production of capital goods. Right. You know, the, mm -hmm. the, the goods which make other equipment. And it's often the case that a lot of specialized capital goods and, you know, specialized labor in that sector is demanded both by the investment goods sector and the military. And so in certain situations, you know, where you have a bottleneck in the capital goods sector, the military contribution to inflation can be like really, really direct. And this was definitely the case during the Vietnam War. And so there's something like really perverse about, you know, responding to war-driven war inflation with more military spending. Yes. Fuck. Um, okay. So maybe this question is for Tim, but if, maybe not. I don't know. To the extent that Biden's advisors want to build an economy around the military industrial complex are they operating on a correct historical understanding 
of, of how military spending worked uh, starting, you know, with World War II and the early Cold War. Like the there's a lot that goes I'm, I'm kind of hinting at like the Nancy Fraser stuff about, you know, like a social a particular con, conjuncture looks a certain way. Right. The relation of class forces looks a certain way. There's a social order that's required to sustain every form of capitalism, you know, and if you're going to separate the social order from the form of economy that existed, you got to tell a story about how that's possible. And I, so to go back to the question, cause I don't, I'm leading the witness constantly with you guys. I'm sorry, but like, what, do, does, does team Biden, how, do you think operate on a correct understanding of like political economy or like new dealism? Yeah, I mean, first, just to, to take it a step backwards and to to demonstrate that they are kind of thinking in these terms, um, I wanted to quote, um, there's something where I end the book chapter that you're talking about. I end with a quotation um, from a, a paper that came out in 2018 called U.S. Foreign Policy for the Middle Class Perspectives from Ohio. This was put out by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Um, and one of the co-authors was Jake Sullivan, who's now the National Security Advisor. Yeah. And, um, you know, this was part of the, the sort of groundwork for the Biden administration's messaging around a foreign policy for the middle class. And I was really interested to read this paper because they're very frank in saying, um, and here I'm quoting, that there is strong support for sustaining or increasing defense spending that provides an economic lifeline for working families and communities. Um, and I think admirably, the, the paper calls for a... Um, a genuine national conversation around the domestic economic benefits of the defense budget rather than mm -hmm. treating it as an open secret. Um, so I thought that was like very interesting, both in its acknowledgement of this thing, but also in, in calling for a conversation about something that has generally been, again, like I think open secret is the perfect phrase. So that's just yeah. a way of, of reinforcing your point, Van, that they are on some level thinking about um, military Keynesianism as part of their, their program, right? Yeah. And so then yeah. the second part of your question is whether they're correctly apprehending the history. I mean, I do, I think that the part of it that I think is true is that, you know, if you think of unemployment, uh, full employment as a level of unemployment, you know, below 4%, that has only rarely been achieved in the U.S. outside of uh, a defense-led mobilization, right? So that's true. It doesn't mean that that's the only way to do it in theory. I think it's clear that you could do it a lot of other ways. And we have seen it in the late 90s. Uh, we saw it just before the pandemic. And we saw it, um, I mean, again, recently, unemployment has been as low as it was uh, you know, during the Vietnam War boom. So it's definitely not the only way to do it, but they're correct that this has been a way it has tended to happen uh, in the U.S. since 1945. Um, but I think to your point about the limitations of the analogy, you know, it's not obvious that having a defense boom means that it'll lead to broadly shared prosperity, right? So um, the sort of the order of classic military Keynesianism takes shape um, as part of the same historical moment as the organization of the CIO, right? The, the industrial um, organization of American workers in the 30s and 40s, you know, it takes place uh, at a time when, you know, 30 to 40 percent of workers are in unions. Um, and today, 7 percent of private sector workers in the yeah. U.S. are in labor unions. And so there's no there's no obvious reason to expect that the fruits of this military Keynesianism would be broadly shared um, in the absence of labor unions. And there's been some good reporting, um, including a piece by Lee Harris in the American mm -hmm. Prospect about um, electrical vehicle battery plants that are getting built, you know, and these have been um, sold by the administration as like green jobs and union jobs. But as a matter of fact, you know, in a lot of these places, even in places like Ohio, um, with some history of labor unions, uh, it's been non-union labor. Not, and they've, yeah. e they've even like, even aside from the workers in the plant, they've like, they've gotten construction workers and janitors from Texas rather than hiring unionized, you know, tradespeople in Ohio. So even today, I think with all the, you know, probably good intentions of the Biden administration, it's not obvious that, you know, either a military boom or an energy transition boom, you know, will lead to the kind of, quote unquote, middle class, broadly shared prosperity of the, the post-1945 years. Yeah. Yeah, I, I will say that, you know, to the extent, I don't think they're mutually exclusive strategies, military Keynesianism versus like a Green New Deal type Inflation Reduction Act investment in, in the green transition. Uh, but but certainly the, the spending on, on the green transition doesn't come with the same kind of um, like dangers in a, in a global world that yeah. uh, military investment does, right? You know, I'm a, a scholar of international relations. I focus on economic issues, but I know a little bit about the, the broader security field. And there's this concept of what people call the security, di security dilemma, where mm -hmm. 
you know, investing in your own defense spending, even if it's for these alternative purposes, right? If it's to like, to goose the economy, uh, as you guys have been saying, although I, I didn't think I'd ever use that phrase again after you told me what, what the origins of it. Uh, but, you know, using the military to build a middle class is really dangerous because it signals to all other countries, you know, they don't know what the U.S. is thinking for sure. They just see an increase in military spending. And in like a looming, growing conflict with, with China, uh, you know, where China sees an increase in U.S. military spending and responds by increasing military spending and freaks out the United States who sees China increasing military spending, we get another arms race like we had in the Cold War. And so this idea of using like the lesson from World War II that that military inv that investment in the military or military spending by the government, you know, was associated with or maybe even caused, um, you know, increased wages and it built a middle class. It's a positive consequence of it, but to, to then do it again, uh, one, like Tim said, we don't have union strength like we had before. So there's reasons to question whether or not it would be effective. But it also comes with all these broader, you know, risks uh, that you know. I think you got to be really careful about. Yeah, even if it worked, we still shouldn't do it, right? I think is <laughs> that's a more succinct somewhat. way. Yeah. <laughs> and and I, I I agree with that. And I think it's it's going to be a fault line on the left, you know, and the especially where the left kind of meets the center left, right? I mean, there are people who yeah. there are people who either think it's the best or only way to get what we want economically, and then there are people who genuinely, you know, think that the U.S. should be taking a more assertive or aggressive posture and you know, in a weird way, the Biden administration has seen a lot of coming together of, you know, further left people and liberal people. But I think that this this question of how much to play with fire here is, is going to be a, a big dividing line in the next couple of years. Yeah, I'm, I'm reminded I, I, I do research on like progressive foreign policy thought and stuff like that. And I'm reminded occasionally that like Teddy Roosevelt was a progressive and he was a fucking racist imperialist. Also, you know, like there's a form of progressivism that if it's not if it doesn't embrace anti-militarism it's like it's almost overdetermined that it embraces militarism i mean like without a commitment to anti-militarism progressive values can go in like a very dark direction you know um one, one you know i get maybe for adam but I, for all these questions are open-ended frankly how it, how much is like military Keynesianism something that's feasible only for the U.S. economically? Like if we bracket off the geopolitics because it's a nightmare, could could the global south or developing economies, you know, or even like other global north countries, like can they do military Keynesianism to goose their economies? I don't know, Adam, has, has this come up in any of your research? No, no, I mean, you know, my my like general sense of this is that the that the U us um or military spending as a percentage of gdp I, I would assume is much higher in the united states than than any other country but i, I, I don't know that for sure you know, i mean it, israel, like, israel would be i think one of the ones that would be really interesting to study um although then again it'd be interesting to to sort of tease out whether you're talking about military keynesism or a kind of you know sector specific tech thing that's happened there um you know i think that my reaction to your question, Van, is that, you know, generally the U.S. has an easier time running expansionary policy because of the special status of the dollar. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that makes it very hard for other countries to do. But that there are case studies you could make of other countries, um, although I think that they would, now that I'm thinking about it, tend to be more like the industrial policy version. Um, one that I happen to know about is, you know, um, Brazil has a globally competitive aircraft company, Embraer. Um, which was founded like the same year as one of the juntas, you know, uh, took over in the late 60s. And I think that they, you know, quite consciously were able to create a coalition of, you know, certain business interests and, you know, the military's interests uh, in order to essentially develop an infant industry to the point where it was globally competitive. Um, yeah. But was that, you know, thinking about Brazil's economy and, the, you know, the, the vast numbers of people in it who aren't even integrated into the formal economy, I would I would probably be skeptical that this is military Keynesism affecting the whole Brazilian economy more than a kind of sector specific, you know, thing aiding the Brazilian aerospace industry. Yeah. I mean, the question comes up for me because East Asia as a matter of like just empirical observation right now is in the, in a process of, it's just a wash in arms. Like, well, did you see is... Noah Smith? I, I tweeted this other day, but did you see Noah Smith had a 
a series of uh, no, but I hate everything he does. So he's, I'm curious. He's terrible. I mean, and he's decided he's some kind of like China hand because he likes anime or you know something absurd like that. What did he say? Um, he said that you know he was like Japan is stagnating, right? So that gets us back to secular stagnation. And he's like, here are four things to do to solve the stagnation. And like number two is get a military industrial complex. God damn it. I fuck it. Just completely, this is... completely unabashed. So someone, someone thinks that. Yeah. So this was my, yeah. Like military modernization is the trend across East Asia. Spending is up across East Asia in certain categories of weapons. Arms racing is happening across East Asia. Um, and the U S is on the wrong side of all of these trends. Like it's fueling them, making them worse. Um, it's not the only, obviously China is a big part of this too, but like, um, so like, <sighs> If everyone, if these governments are plowing money into, you know, advanced weapon systems and million man armies and shit, and their flying geese model is broken, is there a point at which they're sitting around and they're like, hey, let's goose the economy? You know, like, I'm, th that's sort of where I was going with the question, or like, that was what was on my mind. Um, and it sounds like some people are already there, which fucking sucks. And I don't know, you know, I, um, there's obviously a history there, you know, in, in the 1930s, Japan had its own version of, of Keynesian economics, right? And they, mm -hmm. they sort of threw um, sound, what, what used to be called sound money principles out the window, again, on behalf of, of a rearmament. You know, at one point, this, in killed, this involved like murdering the, the finance minister, like assassinating him because he was a kind of balanced budget guy. And there are people who thought, you know, that you could actually do a kind of Keynesian thing in service of rearmament. Um, and then I think the, you know, the memory of the Korean War thing is strong in Japan, and I've also found talking to people from South Korea that there's also an awareness in South Korea that the Vietnam War had a beneficial effect on the South Korean economy. You know, I've had people who are not especially political and certainly not left wing say to me just matter of factly that the Vietnam War was like a Marshall Plan for South Korea. So there's obviously a long history there that I, I can't imagine people have forgotten. Um, but also there's, you know, strong anti-militarist traditions in those countries, you know, probably beyond what you have in, in the U.S. So maybe that's a reason to be optimistic. Um, I've, I've kind of joked that like the Biden's advisors and like the Jake Sullivan's are kind of doing a Carl Schmidt as political economy. And I, I say it jokingly, but it's also to me kind of the essence of what's happening, right? Like is if you organize political economy on the basis of like friend enemy distinctions abroad, right? That's the, that's what the heart of quote unquote friend shoring is like onshoring supply chains and shit. Well, or like not on shoring supply chains, but just diverting them to your buddies, right? What is, I, I feel like this is really, really shitty, but those are my instincts. Like, do you see a problem here? And if so, what is it for both of you guys or either? Why don't you tell us more what you, but why is your instinct that it's bad? Because Carl Schmidt was a fucking Nazi and like <laughs> friend, friend, no. enemy distinctions are, are um, fluid, you know, like the Biden's America's enemies under Biden are not America's enemies under Trump necessarily, right. you know, or like DeSantis. So like right. you have, there's not, there's nothing that's actually like a guiding principle there. It's just right. like whoever is in power gets to fucking throw like throw out the goodies or whatever would you be more comfortable with it if it used a like a substantive criterion like something more than just friend yes i mean first principles of some kind yeah yeah or a theory of the case i don't know like well like the, you know this idea of having like a carbon tax for uh you know steel and things like that you know it's gonna mm -hmm. shift uh, where we import steel to, to certain countries that are able to produce it that way. So, yeah. you know, there are other ways of doing this in, in more like, you know, sort of substantive way, addressing other things that we care about, uh, rather than just trading with, with uh, you know, our allies for the sake of it. Yeah. I mean, it's like political economy is not as positive sum these days or as it used to be, but there is a difference between zero sum economic policies and friend enemy economic you know like and that's like you know that that's a very good example that you just gave of like 
Well, there's a, there could be a zero sumness in applying a carbon tariff, but that is not a friend enemy zero. You know, it's a different kind of flavor. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a historian, so I'm always just thinking about the, the historical parallels. And it's, you know, your perspective is kind of interesting because to me it recalls, you know, U.S. politics around 1948 are interesting because, um, you know, essentially the far left of the at least electoral politics is Henry Wallace, who wants nothing more than just to sell wheat to the Soviet Union. And then mm -hmm. it's actually like the people who we think of as internationalists and the founders of, you know, the sort of liberal international economic order who actually want to sort of not do that. Right. So you have the sort of it's yeah. the left who is standing behind this principle of sort of global commerce uh, rather than, you know, the, the people who are actually would have called themselves capitalist internationalists. And so it'd be interesting if there's something similar in our own moment where the sort of the defense of, of global commerce ends up falling to, you know, people on the left. Hmm. That's a good point. Um, we're almost done here. I, I want to get to inflation because it's just so foregrounded right now. Um, you know, 40 year high in broad strokes, how should people understand it, explain it? Um, and like for both of you, Tim, I know you've been talking, you've been doing the rounds recently. Um, Robert Reich has this thesis that he's been floating that seems like it bears out that it's corporate profiteering is where a lot of this is coming from. At a minimum, cutting corporate profits would help. Um, but like, what else is going on with inflation? It's like, how do you explain it? Is Reich right? Uh, should I take that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think we've had really several different inflations over the last, you know, two years or so, right? The first one was clearly just related to the pandemic and the shutdown. And, you know, there was really a choice, I think, between allowing there to be a depression uh, and accepting some level of inflation uh, by, you know, keeping incomes at the same level while most of the economy shut down. And so to the extent that that was the first inflation, it was sort of a sign of the success of the policy. Um, you know, then I think there was a kind of, and that first, in that first wave, uh, price increases were really dominated by durable goods, right? Because no one was buying services anymore or going out to eat, but they were ordering Pelotons or, you know, whatever, um, <laughs> whatever the, you know, the equivalents of Pelotons are down the class ladder. Um, then as the economy opened up, you know, you saw a shift into some, uh, you know, service prices, right? Um, I think, you know, restaurants are probably the places I personally noticed it most because I don't, you know, drive a car a lot. Um, and then we had the most recent thing, which is really related to the war in Ukraine, right? And it's been centered in, in energy prices. Now, even that part of it seems to be, well, you got to be careful here to, to distinguish the U.S. from Europe, right? Europe is still facing a really, you know, serious energy crisis and, and has resorted to price caps and price controls to prevent energy prices from sort of completely um, destabilizing the economy. But in the U.S., you know, uh, core inflation, um, which excludes energy and food prices, and even um, headline inflation, which includes energy and food prices, both came in cooler than expected, actually, in the, the latest report that just came out today. Um, and insofar as prices are still rising, actually, a lot of it is in rent. Um, so there may even be a new sort of phase of the inflation now. So it's been many, many different things. Uh, but to answer your question about Robert Reich, I think it's plain that, that corporate profits have some connection to the inflation. And part of why I strongly believe that is, you know, even... Um, some of the governors of the Federal Reserve Board are saying that, and they're not people who go out of their way to criticize corporate behavior um, or to criticize profit making. And so the yeah. fact that even they are feeling it um, makes me think that, okay, these people who generally like business, but also have a job of keeping inflation down, they see it as part of the problem. Uh, we on the left definitely should as well. That said, it's, it's not as easy as you might think to describe how it's happening or how the connection between profits and prices has worked, um, partly because, you know, mainstream economics just doesn't examine these questions of, you know, what is pricing? How does pricing power work? Uh, they yeah. they assume that the world is basically structured like, a, you know, the market in grain describes the prices of automobiles, and it's just not true. Um, but even on the left in sort of heterodox econ circles, I think um, there's not a clear sort of synthetic analysis of what prices and profits are. Um, and my sort of you know political solution to this theoretical problem is that we need some kind of standing congressional committee to just investigate empirically how prices are set and how they relate to profits you know with some kind of subpoena power um you know i think price controls are clearly politically off the table now but it should be politically possible to just have this investigated right and open up some of these decisions which are just treated as a complete black box uh to public scrutiny 
And then I would hope, you know, the intellectual part of me hopes that that would be the raw material for a better theory of how all this works. Because it seems to me that even as I share Reich's sort of general intuition, I, I haven't seen a really comprehensive account from the left or from the progressive side about how exactly the profit price nexus has been working. The only thing I'd add to this, uh, you know, and this is pretty outside of my research area, uh, is just that, you know, before the inflation crisis, if you'd asked me, you know, about inflation, I would have pointed out that inflation is is bad for uh, creditors, but that it's good for debtors. Uh, and we've had a debate in this country about the Biden administration's uh, plan to forgive student debt. And so, like, we, we had this, this uh, you know, national spotlight on the issue of debtors, people who have all this college debt. But I haven't seen people drawing this connection of inflation is also going to be good for people who have student debt. You know, obviously they face all of the short-term uh, negative consequences of inflation that everybody else does as a consumer. Uh, but over the long term, you know, years of, of high inflation like we had, uh, you know, earlier on in the 70s, uh, like contributed to upward mobility for people who took out money to go to college and, and made it relatively easy for them to pay it back um, later on. Obviously, the, the cost of going to college was much lower in real terms back then, too. Um, but my understanding is that inflation was a big part of how of how people paid off their student debts in the you know 70s and 80s and, and moving forward. Uh, but I haven't seen people talking about that, that, it, that inflation has a positive side. It's, a, it's such a good point. And I, I just wanted to add that um, a point that Adam Tooze has been making, which is it's not just individuals with debts that benefit. It's uh, it's public debt, right? The real value of public debt goes down. And, you know, he's he, Tooze has been making this point in a couple of venues that, you know, if you had if you had told someone in 2018 that you could like lower the real value of all these you know deficits around the world by X percent through, you know, 10 percent inflation, people would have thought that was great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the so like. In, there's a so what you guys are talking about is like inflation is something that is pros and cons in a way, right? Um, but it's not an unmitigated evil, um, particularly if it's not, you know, out of hyperinflation or whatever. Um, but so like, I have this huge beef with monetary policy and the Fed specifically, just doing it, they like they, they recognize that it's the what's happening is more complicated than like a wage price spiral and yet they're just responding as if it were a wage price spiral and you have to crater the fucking economy in order to cool inflation and that seems like absolute nonsense to me like that seems like you're working on behalf of like plutocratic interests at that point right class warriors of like the worst kind and so like one you know what do you think about that but two is monetary policy as it's being operated right now by Jerome Powell, like, is that at cross purposes with Biden administration policy? I mean, it's certainly, it's certainly working at cross purposes to creating more jobs. It's definitely dampening right. the economy I mean, and, and the way that, you know, the way that it's covered, I just, I didn't get a chance to read much about it today, but like Tim was mentioning, like the latest report is that inflation has has come down a little bit. I mean, it's still very high, but it's come, come down. But the the way it's being reported in the headlines is that like this is evidence that increasing interest rates is working to tame inflation. <laughs> it's to just not, you know how that's you know it's consistent yeah. with that. But, but like you're saying, if it's uh, Tim had like this great chronology of these different waves, or different causes of inflation in the last two years. You know, to the extent that we're in this this new wave um, that Tim was talking about from the war in Ukraine, you know, if it's energy prices and and shipping issues, like it's not going to be addressed through increasing interest rates. That that aspect of it won't be. So, you know, to to like, you know, politically, if it leads the Fed to stop raising interest rates so quickly, that'll be good for you know the continued recovery from the uh, the pandemic. Um, mm. But. It's not it's not clear that just because inflation dipped, it's because of the Fed increasing interest rates so much. It may or may not be. Yeah. Yeah, I, lo I love that point that Adam ended on because, yeah, it is a it's a strange moment for, for people who think the way we do, because, yeah, we want we want inflation to fall because it'll put an end to this inflation panic. But we also don't really want the Fed to get credit for it in some some you know kind of cargo cult uh, yeah. way. And so it's, you know. That's a puzzle. I guess I'd 
I'd rather inflation come down, um, even if it requires the Fed, you know, looking good. Um, but yeah, in the long term, we have to think about the Fed, even when the Fed is willing to admit that interest rates won't solve the underlying, you know, origins of inflation, they still rely on interest rates to do it. Well, that's what we've learned from this cycle, right? So then the question is, you know, assuming that even this if it's is, a bad tool, they'll still use it. And even if you can make them admit that it's a bad tool, right? That's what we didn't really know before, you know, but we knew there was a bad tool maybe, but now Powell would just say, yeah, it's true that raising interest rates won't drill any new oil wells, but I'm still going to do it because I have to do something. Now we know that, you know, that sort of intellectual persuasion isn't enough. It's an institutional question about either creating some other power somewhere else in the government, which can use better tools or, you know, forcing the Fed, you know, sort of with some kind of outside pressure to do things differently than they did this time around. Well, this is um, depressing, but it's a very good conversation. I appreciate you guys coming on the show. Um, Adam's book again is opening up by cracking down labor repression and trade liberalization in democratic developing countries. Um, guys, I appreciate your time. This and let me, let me put a plug in for um, the military and the market edited by Mark Wilson and, and Jennifer Middlestadt. Um, in addition to my essay, there's a bunch of other great essays in there you can read. Yes. I've actually ordered it. He gave me a, a, a review copy of his chapter, but I ordered the book anyway, because it sounds really good. So, <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks guys. This is Thanks awesome. Thanks to both of you. Yeah. Thanks right. so much.